Welcome to another awesome day of FileMaker Training, where we're desperately pushing little buttons here on our broadcast system. So welcome to Friday broadcast training for the FileMaker platform. We could call it the Claire's FileMaker platform. Anyway, so uh, very exciting today. We have Christian Olson, who's here, is doing a lot of awesome stuff. And uh, so before we dive into that, I want a reminder that Monday is a uh, is an official ho uh, presidential holiday in the United States. Today is uh, Christian Olson, and then uh, Tuesday starts our JavaScript mayhem. So that is coming up. If I hit the, if you go to our website right here, you press the button, come down. You can see uh, Leland Long. That is Leland coming up on JavaScript. That'll be two weeks. So two weeks of free training starting Tuesday, February 21st. It'll go two weeks. Um, and then the week after that, if you want to continue with some really awesome JavaScript training, that part of it's going to be a paid event. So uh, we sent an email out to everyone about that. So that is coming up. So a reminder, once again, nothing on Monday. So some of you will log in on Monday going, what the hell? And so just be warned that that is coming and you were warned that we're not going to be here. Well, that is kind of the upcoming broadcast schedule. As a reminder, if you want to support the channel, we greatly appreciate it. Go to fmtraining.tv up here. I definitely check out the bundles button right here. Purchasing one of the uh, bundles is very, very useful. Help support the channel. So welcome to today. So Christian, we're going to quit sharing my screen. We're going to switch to your screen. What are we doing okay. today, Christian? This is always what I ask people like, hey, we want to come on the show. I said, well, when you're going to, the first thing you're going to come to the show, you're going to tell people what you're doing and why they should give a sh So That's really what are funny because the top of my so notes say, what are we doing and why? That was the first thing I wrote down. Uh, we didn't chat about people this. Give a shit about what you're doing. Tell us why. Yeah. So, uh, well, first, what happened is Margaret was like, "Hey, we need people to do the stream. Can anyone please help us?" And so I thought about it, and um, unlike all the exciting some you know add-ons I have, this is a little bit more of a nut and bolt type things. But there's a technique that I've been using. I use it on one project, then I use it on another one. And I've, I've now used it a handful of times. I said, you know, this would be this would be fun to come stream on. There was another thing I thought would be fun to share, but I can't remember what it is anymore. Um, but this is something that you can use for uh, multiple applications. This has a specific application, but I'll talk about how I've used it in, in a couple different ways. Um, and I'll and I'll specifically mention some of the projects I've used it on and and where it has been helpful. In fact, I should nuke this thing and get it ready for uh, resco. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do in the in the process of this is kind of just talk about some some general techniques that that I use, um, how how I set up certain scripts, how I pass uh, parameters to the scripts, how I get the results. Um, and and if you get one thing out of this stream, I don't know that we've done a topic on it before, because like I was saying, I have been watching Nick. So some of these things you know, might be like, oh, well, Nick showed something like that. That's very well possible. Um, but one of these techniques, I actually got it from another RCC engineer, and I'm like, this is really helpful um, because forever you haven't been able to solve this one problem. But FileMaker has some new functions. They're not brand, brand new um, that allow you to do some stuff that you couldn't before. Um, specifically, putting a file into a container, going to PSOS, and importing from that container. Um, if you guys have ever tried this before, you know that the export commands to get out of the container don't work. Sometimes you can do an insert from URL, um, but there's actually an easier way to do this. So I've got a piece of code you can steal right out of this for that. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So you're talking about exporting out of a container on the server side. So you can do that's, an import. That, I, I, I haven't run into that late. I haven't done tried to do that lately, but that is a non-supported script step on server when you were on a piece. Correct. Off. Most of the the uh, the export type commands like that from the container just you can't do them. And even if they are supported, they're sandbox, which means you're limited to where they can drop, mostly in the documents or temp directory, I think. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so David David Angel's kind of already a little head on that. And so where to give people in some context on this, because, again, I've used it in multiple places, but I'll, I'll give you guys a very real-world scenario, which in your day-to-day -day developing, you might not encounter this a lot. But I've got a client, and he's got an old system, not FileMaker, uh, that is deprecated and no longer supported. And so I need to rebuild his entire system. Um, in FileMaker. And he's had this system, I don't know exactly how long, but I'm going to say decades with a D. Um, and so there's a lot of data in there. And as we have tried to move sections of his database over from his system into FileMaker, um, I've had to re-import over and over again to get, basically get everything lined up. And uh, if you do this one time, you might be willing to sit and wait painfully while it imports. 
Um, but our first import, our first big import, I, I turned it on on a Friday afternoon before I left. And uh, it almost finished by Saturday, Sunday afternoon. So I realized this was not really going to be something that we could continue to, to do. We need to make it go faster. And how can we make this go faster? So this is one of the ways that I handled it. The other thing that has come up um, for importing and, and some other processes is let's imagine you've got a table and you've got, let's just say a million records in there and you do an import into it and you realize the import, it went bad and you need to get rid of just those records you imported. So years ago, sometimes what I would do is do a find on like the timestamp or the creation, find something and then and then do a delete all. Um, it just kind of massage the data a little bit, but the technique that I'm gonna show you off here makes it really easy that if you have a bad import, that you can just, you can nuke it and, and start back over again. And in fact, for uh, this client and other clients, I use a similar technique when we have to go to the server to duplicate a parent record and all of its children. So the, we're going to talk about importing, but you can actually use this for some other things of basically kind of managing it. Um, but why don't, we, why don't we go ahead and dive into it? So I'll share my screen here. And I want to give a couple quote unquote disclaimers here at the beginning. Let's move that out. Anyone has any problems seeing my screen? Let me know. We did a little test before. It seemed like everything's good. I'm going to close these extra Zoom items. Disclaimer number one. Um, I tried to make this file so that you guys can use it locally. And Margaret, you're sharing the demo file. Is that right? Yes. I was going to ask if you want me to share it at the end or right now. Yeah, you can share it whenever. Um, while I tried to make it that this can work locally, I have to stress that this is really designed for server. That's the whole purpose of all of this. And some of the features just abjectly won't work on the client. Um, like I didn't spend enough time to make this truncate button work locally. You, you need to have it hosted and that's, and that's fine. Um, the other thing is in terms of it working on a hosted solution, um, you probably have some sort of logic in your own databases or you should to, to identify whether or not PSOS is available. Those of you that are familiar with starting point know that we have a, a, a variable called is PSOS functional or PSOS functional equals yes. Nick Hunter really likes to do double dollar sign PSOS with a one if it's available or not. So you're going to need to have some sort of logic of whether PSOS is available. Under the custom functions, I've got a custom function called PSOS functional. Okay. And let's open this up real quick. And let's talk about this because this isn't just for this demo file. This is actually something that I'm using pretty regularly now. And I'll talk about why. But over here, you can see for starting point, this is the logic you would have. For Nick stuff, this is the logic you would have. Whatever your logic is, you, you put it in here. And so um, why am I doing this with a custom function? Well, right now, I just have this set to one to basically say, look, I know PSOS is available for this demo. I want to use it. But one of the things that I've kind of been finding is over time, things change. And you don't necessarily know how they'll change. Global variables are really dynamic in that way. But one of the things I like about custom functions, and, and I'll show you this in one of the scripts, is if our thinking on something in the future changes, going and changing a custom function is really easy, and then you can update an entire file. This is a technique that I started using with my add-ons, and I like quite a bit. So in all of my solutions moving forward, I basically use this custom function and whatever the logic is for that file for there being PSOS, I bake it into here. So if you guys download this and you're trying to use it locally, you got to come in here and put a zero to turn it off. Um, and if you got it hosted, you might need to put your own logic in there. Okay, I think I've spent enough time on that. So we'll cancel that. Okay, I think I had one other gotcha at the beginning here. Um, doesn't make sense. Some features will out, no, blah, 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 blah. Okay, perfect. So let's go ahead and uh, talk about what's going on here first. So again, the specific scenario that we're gonna use in this one is that you're doing a massive import from one area into your database and you wanna manage that import. And so we've got an import table that is pretty basic. Um, it's got an ID. It actually has a child ID of itself, which we'll talk about here. And then just some things like ID constant, a list of its own IDs, a purpose and a status. On the relationship graph, what we do is we take that import table and we make a relationship to all of the tables that we're importing into based on this key of ID import. And importantly, we turn on the dangerous cascade delete checkbox here. So you'll notice in the name on all these, they all look pretty similar. Um, 
uh, import is the key. And I like to add this little tilde delete on the end. It's really nice to be able to go back in here and see exactly what it is that's going to be deleted. And I'll show it to you later in the script. But for these tables, we've got the key for ID import with an auto enter calculation. And all that calculation is, is dollar sign ID import. So what you're gonna see is before I do the import into the tables, we set this variable and that allows them to all get related to this parent um, import. And that's what allows them to be deleted in a very kind of controlled fashion over here. And additionally, and this is maybe a little bit more confusing, but I have found that some of these imports might be sequenced together. Um, and so I actually create a master import and then children import records. And so in the import table, it again has its a key to itself. And this one is based on a double dollar sign. And what that means is that I can go over here. I have a relationship from import to import with the cascade delete turned on. If I delete the master here, it deletes the children. When it deletes its children, it will delete the targeted records that we're looking for. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump out of here. Looking over at my notes. Da, 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 da. Okay, so I wanna show you guys now a little trick that I'm using for in here. Um, I'm gonna be importing from, did I hide it? I don't know, there it is. I've got my Dropbox set up right now with a handful of CSV files. And so I want to say, hey, go to this folder and get these. There's actually a cool trick with a uh, with one of the plugins where you can drop the folder into a container and it'll get the file path. But I wanted to do a demo without any plugins. And so what I do here in one of my scripts, I just go in here and I do a um, import step. Now, some of you might be savvier than I am with getting file paths. I'm not necessarily the best person at it. So I just cheat. And I'll come over here and I'll say, hey, add a file. I'll go find my Dropbox folder. I'll find one of those files and I say open. And FileMaker actually does a lot of the heavy lifting for me. And there is my path. Okay, so I'm going to delete that. And that's what I did here. So I've got a path. And then you don't have to do this, but I when I was doing my imports, we kept changing the folder a lot, even though it was all in kind of the uh, this parent structure of Dropbox. And so I've got a folder up here called import. It's nice about this, like for my client, we have version one, version two, version three of the imports. Um, they're all in one master folder. And so I can just change this without having to do that trick of going and refining the path. Hopefully that makes sense there. Um, so this script right here is kind of what starts all of it. And uh, let, let's just do a quick import and then I'll walk back through everything. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna click import. I'm gonna make sure one thing is off real quick though. Beautiful. So we're gonna do import. I'm gonna say, okay, and it's gonna do some stuff, okay? So one of the other things, it's just a little nice thing, you don't need this, but as I was doing these imports, one of the issues I was having is, is just getting a glimpse of like, is the data coming over? Does it look right? Like, was it successful? And so I added this screen where I can kind of see the tables at a quick glance. You'll notice invoices missing on there. And so then I've got sales over here, okay? So again, with the import, I've got very few fields going on. I basically state the purpose of the import. In this case, this is the master one. So if I delete this, it'll kill both of those. Well, if I delete this one, it's just gonna kill the data. And then I can say, in this case, we're dealing with customer data. So we've got states and contacts. And then over here, we're dealing with sales data. And then I've got a, um, a status, which is import. Um, the status on this actually becomes really helpful because one of the tricks in this demo file is we're going to be sending instructions to PSOS, but we're going to turn the wait for PSOS off. So I think that pretty much everyone in here, or most of you have messed around with PSOS a bit. And I know in some of Nick's files he, or Nick's demos, he's talked about turning the uh, wait for PSOS off. But I think generally speaking, most of us wait for the wait for it. This allows us to get some sort of response and is really useful. Um, but if it's a really long process, you're locking your client up and you're waiting for it to finish what you're doing. Um, so with my client, we're importing a lot of tables. Some of them are dependent upon other tables, which I'm going to come back to here in a moment. But a lot of them are not. So what we do is we say, hey, go import this and don't wait for it to come back. 
go to the next one, import it, don't wait for it to come back. And we can basically start the import on numerous tab tables at the exact same time. Now, you're going to be impacted by the read and write speeds of the server itself, but it's really kind of neat having all of those imports running um, alongside each other, but it means that you don't have any feedback of any of any errors or what's going on. So this status field right here is really nice. For example, one of the things that's in this demo file is we're going to delete these imports, and some of them can take a long time to delete. So if wait for PSOS is off, you don't know has everything blown up, what is going on. And so on that one, I'll actually change the status from import to delete. And again, I can just give some user feedback um, without waiting for the PSOS uh, to, to return. The other thing that I really like about this with wait for PSOS off is that you don't lock your client up. And so I had mentioned at the beginning of this, the first test we did, um, I locked up, fortunately, a secondary computer, but I locked it up from Friday to Sunday. Um, as you can imagine, maybe there's other files or other customers I want to work on and not just have my computer locked up on it. So that's kind of what that is for there. All right. Da, 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 da. Um, the one thing you do need to be cautious of if you have the wait for PSOS off, and I'll show you to configure this in a moment, is that some tables may be getting data from other tables. So to use my clients as an example, the first set of tables that we do, I call them lookup tables. These are supporting tables. They don't really have modules, but everything else gets data from them. And so I have the wait for PSAW set to on because if we start running, if I if I do like a states import, which is actually an example in here, um, before uh, and it doesn't finish before contacts go and contacts have an ID for state, that, that lookup might fail. So you need to be conscientious in terms of how you set the wait for PSAW off. But let's jump into the script a little bit here. All right, so this is the master script that's going on. The first thing we do is basically just set some paths to tell us where we're getting this information from. Um, and then I always like having these dialogues, even for myself. Um, pushing that button could mean that you're waiting uh, minutes, hours, or days. And so it's really nice, even as a developer, to have a safety on there. Like, you sure <laughs> you sure you want to do this? Like. You're about to wipe everything out um, and also maybe wait for a long time. The other thing that I added is that before I do an import, I might want to get rid of the last import. And so I have this uh, variable right here, and it can be configured in two different ways. One of them that I have off that I'll show you as an example is you can just make a list and you can give it the IDs of the imports that you want to nuke. And I'll show you an example of that here in a second. But what I found most often is it's really nice to just do this from the user interface. So if I'm over here and I click import, it takes a summary field of the list IDs and it just nukes everything on screen. So if I just want to nuke sales, I can come over here and I can omit those. And if I do import, it's just going to delete the sales. Now I'm going to end up with two customers right now, which is fine. But now if we do show all, You'll see I have that original master, customers, master, customers, and then sales. And so this has become really useful because, again, to use my customer as an example, we do this massive import um, of 15 tables, we'll say. I forget the exact number. And you realize after that five-hour process, two tables had a mistake. You don't want to delete everything. So what I'll do is I'll come in here and I'll just isolate the two imports that I want to kill. Again, just kind of maybe an omit, omit. And then I run it from right there. And if we take the script back over here, it's going to get a list of those IDs and say, hey, we need, to, we need to nuke these. And the way that it does that is we have two scripts down here. I don't know why that's white. I think we had this issue last time. Just a couple of my script subs are going to turn white on us, unfortunately. Um, but we have two ways of deleting the tables. This is the targeted one that's really nice. So we're going to go to delete import start. And delete import start basically takes that parameter. What are my list of IDs? We're going to check and make sure that we have a list of IDs. And if we don't, we're going to abort. And then otherwise, we're going to go to this little condition right here. So I mentioned at the beginning that I like to do this custom function for is PSOS functional. This is something that I'm using in all of my files now. You'll see this in a couple different scripts. It's pretty comp or it's pretty similar. Where basically, I come in here, I go, hey, is PSOS functional? If so, let's call that next script on server. Else, let's open a new window, let's call it locally, and then let's close the window. And this is just a rinse and repeat that I use over and over again. We also pass ID import. 
depending on your situation, you might be able to say, hey, you know what, go nuke those and don't worry about coming back before proceeding. But you might also find that, you know what, I know that it actually takes a while for this to delete. Um, so I'm gonna need to have wait for completion uh, on. <laughs> um, so this is, these steps are both in here just so that you guys can come in and either comment on or off as you need. It's it's This is not for customer facing, this is very much a developer facing type of thing. Additionally, if you're running it local, which I don't recommend, um, or you have wait for completion on, we have a step down here to get some, some results um, so that we can pass the messaging back. This is pretty much for diagnostics. And then on server, we take that ID import, again, make sure that we correctly passed it. And then we go to this other table where we put the ID in and do a GTRR. I can show that to you briefly. So that's this table. This table has very, very little in it. It has an ID, a global. It has a container that we'll talk about shortly. And then I always just leave ID constant. So we put that key in here. We do a GTRR to import. And at that point, we can go ahead and uh, update them. Remember I said we like to change the status to deleting because some of these can actually take a considerable amount of time to delete. And that'll give me some user feedback on here to say, hey, this is in the process of being deleted. Um, and then it deletes all records, okay? Now let me go back to the parent script and give you guys a caveat on this. Because this is one of the main things I wanted to show off. It's really cool. Because like in my customer's file, um, we're importing new tables primarily, um, but we're also importing into like the notes table and other tables that we're already using. And so I can't just delete the entire table. So this is really nice in that you can have a specific data set and just nuke that. In fact, I have an opportunity to show you guys that. I just realized we're gonna go to states or was it contacts? There we go. So I think we have two contacts over here. Beautiful. So we have two customers. So over here, you're gonna see that I have 22 records. We're gonna use our imagination for a moment and say, oh, you know what? Import number two was a failure, but we don't wanna lose those original 11 contacts. So we just come over here, we click the, click the delete, come over here and there's those 11. So we target delete that one inside of the table. So that's really handy for my client because we've already got tens of thousands of note records and we don't wanna delete all of them. We just wanna delete the new ones. But the caveat here is that while this cascade delete is very powerful, like very fast and very targeted, it has a limitation. Part of that limitation is gonna come down to the complexity of the table, like how many fields are in it, what are some of the validations. And so one of the issues that you can have um, is if you try to delete too much with the cascade delete, it's gonna lock FileMaker up. Now, I'm gonna give you two scenarios because again, it's hard to say this many records will cause the issue. I have up here a warning that if you're deleting over 500,000 records, you might not wanna use the cascade delete. Now, for my client, we actually uh, quickly and easily delete a million records. Um, that table has very, very few records with no real relationships. And so going in there and cascading, deleting a million records, it actually goes really quickly. But we have a few other tables that are wide with lots of relationships and lots of validations. And when I try to delete, I don't know the exact number, but we'll say hundreds of thousands to over a million records. The cascade delete actually takes anywhere between 12 and 24 hours. Again, another reason why that wait for completion being off is really nice, because if you accidentally pull the trap card, as Jacob likes to call it, at least your file maker is not locked up. So if you have that scenario, there's a couple ways to pair uh, to deal with this. One of them is to just truncate the records, which of course are not showing up. So I'm gonna highlight them for you. Truncate is stupid fast. It doesn't do any validations. It doesn't do any cascade deletes um, and it's fast, 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 but it kills the entire table. So one of the things that I've paired this with is I have a truncate for all of my tables available and I might just come in and say, you know what? Don't, don't delete those ones. Just turn on and off the ones I wanna delete. And then I'm gonna turn them all back on for a second. And then up here, there's that script. So I would turn this one on, turn this one off. You can actually have them both on, but I'm still passing ID import, okay? Because at the bottom of the truncate one, we go, hey, 
let's go call the cascade delete. So what you can do is say, hey, let's go blow up those tables that we don't, we're not really worried about targeted deletions. And then let's just target delete. So for my client, this means that we're blowing up his lookup tables. It means we're blowing up customers and orders, but we're target deleting the tables that we're, we're using functionally and can't just, just nuke. Um, Margs, at any point, if anyone has questions, feel free to interrupt me, but otherwise I'm gonna kind of keep flowing with this. So the next thing that we wanna do, uh, so now that we've kind of cleaned our plate, we wanna initiate the import. And so we go to our import table, we make a new record, and we give it a purpose and a status. Again, this is, you can put your own rhyme or reason on this, but more importantly, we set this global variable, double dollar sign ID import, which as I showed earlier, will string the new imports to the parent, okay? And then this section, um, I tried to, to tried to write it in such a way, and it's, it's exactly how I use it out of some of my own files so that you can customize it for your own if you need something like this. And so what we do is we just have a list of file names. So let's go look at that Dropbox folder again for a second. Uh, where are you at Dropbox? Oh, I might've closed it, we'll reopen it. There we go. So remember, we already got the path here. So all I have to do is come in and say, you know what, this is the file that I want. So I just highlight that, move this out of my way, come over here and say, you know what, for the customer section of my import, I just wanna get the contacts and the state CSV, okay? And you could decide to do them all together, you could break them apart, it kinda depends how you look at it. So again, to use my client as an example, we have this, what I call lookup section. We have these customer tables, all the stuff that supports uh, people and locations and contacts and phone numbers and addresses and things related to the people. Then we have an ordering section and an invoicing and a, there's, there's several sections. So this one down here is real simple. It's just the invoices. And once I'm done here, I'm gonna also give you guys an example of how quickly this can work. Um, so these tables, as you saw, 11 records, 22 records, of course, they're going to be fast. Um, but the import that I'm using on this for my client, it, it's somewhere between one and two million records. And it, and it goes pretty darn fast. So the other thing that we do, or that I do, is I take uh, those parameters and I put it into a JSON array. And so I'm going to show you this in a couple different places in the file. But more and more, I've been using JSON to both pass and receive parameters back. And one of the things I like about it, um, for example, over Nick's use of list, and list was great. I used it for a long time, but the issue I have with list is if you have a gap in there um, or adding different things, you, you need to know that the order they're in it and you need to deal with the gaps appropriately. One of the things I like about using JSON parameters, kind of like the hash function, is at any point in time, you can add new parameters and missing parameters doesn't abjectly break old things. And I'll, I'll show you a custom function I'm using for this. So right now we're just building an array. We're gonna pass those file names as a list, and then we're gonna pass the purpose of this import. Why, uh, why do I use JSON over assign? I'll, I'll show you in just a second, John, actually. Though I would say it's a Coke Pepsi type of thing, um, but we're gonna go to this next group file loop. I'm glad John's here too, because it's actually John's piece of code that I stole that I'm gonna show you guys off here that I, that I quite like. So now we're gonna to go to this thing called file loop. And uh, one of the custom functions I'm giving you guys, um, it kind of reminds me of the one I used from Nick for a long time where you say get script parameter and you just say, I want the first, second, third or fourth. So I've got this thing called parameter JSON. And so I'll put the script parameter in here. It could even just be get script parameter. I like having the variable in case I change it. And then I say the name of the object I'm looking for. So uh, nothing, nothing too fancy here if you guys are familiar with JSON, but all it does is say, hey, give me that JSON array and give me that piece. And then it deals with errors a little bit. The reason I like doing uh, it in here and the reason some of you guys might like it is if you're not super familiar with JSON, it makes it really easy. You just have to remember that however you wrote it over here, that is the file names right there, needs to match what you do on this side. So that's what that's what's right there. So you can do this with the hash function too, technically, but one of my issues with the hash function is that it, it invisibly declares the variables, if you will. And I um, know that I'm prone. I'm gonna do something right now real quick. I'm gonna do a set field, any random one, and I'm gonna put a fake variable. So I like to spell things wrong. And 
monkey bread is really fantastic that it will highlight that in red and say, Christian, you screwed up. And so I like my variables to be declared. Doesn't mean you can't do this with a hash function, but you don't have to. Whereas with the JSON, you very much have to say, this is a variable, this is a variable. The other thing that I'm doing is that I'm inheriting that Dropbox path that we had before. Um, so we're just gonna check and make sure that we're not missing anything uh, that we need. And then we're gonna go make a new import record. So if you recall, the import table will inherit the global ID import. So this one is a child of the master import. And then we give it a purpose, which we pass via the parameter. So that can be customers, sales, whatever you want to organize these as. And then very, very important here is we grab the ID from that, uh, that import record that gets created. Okay. And now we're going to go to this table called director. Director really just needs to be a table in your database that has one record that isn't going to be record locked because you need to have a container on there. So we're going to do, 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 uh, scroll down. I don't see what John's saying quite yet, but I'll glance at it in just a moment, John. So now we're just going to do a loop. We just want to figure out how many possible files we want. We're going to get the first file, then the second file, then the third file. We're going to concatenate the path, the Dropbox path, with the name of the file. So if you recall, we have this folder and we're going to say, give me this file and this file and this file. And then we're going to put some logic in here. Do we want PSOS to wait or not? Um, the way that I have this done is I say, hey, if the file name equals whatever file you want to wait on, one, I'll zero. So or this file or this file or this file. However you want to construct this logic. While you're troubleshooting, I might suggest just turning this off and put wait for completion on. Because the first time you do this, it's probably not gonna work. And getting error messages back from the server is really useful. Okay, I'll take a pause here right after this part. So this is this is one of the parts that really matters. So we're on this table, I'm gonna show this to you. So we're actually over here, oh, it doesn't show up. We're over here right now, and there's this container, and we're actually taking the file from Dropbox and we're putting into this container. It has to be a local uh, index, or not an index, it needs to be a stored uh, container. It can't be a global, or when you go to the server, it won't have anything in there, okay? So we're going here and we're, we're, we're putting our CSV file into that. And then I'm gonna pause for just a second because I do see some activity over here. Uh, there's I think mostly John let me... From John, so. What's, what's John's question? Was it just the sign one? Uh, do you know if you can override the MBS screaming by using the app parameter variable? Oh, turn the red off? You absolutely can. Is that that's what he's asking? So if you go to MBS plugins and you go to MBS and you do configure somewhere in here. Probably right in front of me. Syntax colorization with links. It's it's somewhere right in front of me here. I don't know. I'm not seeing it. I also don't like to turn it off. If loop links, check var check variable names. There it is. So that's where you go. Oh, no, Christian, uh, that tells MBS that nope. a variable is expected as a parameter. Maybe I'm not understanding. Did you, oh, did you know that you can override the MBS screaming by using, you know, um, I'm gonna steal that from you too, John, because I did know, because Christian Smith's told me, or um, not Christian Smith's, um, Mr. Watson, but I forget every time <laughs> um, and I can never remember how to do it. So I knew that you somehow put it in a comment and it knows to use it. So. Halfway no, but can never get it to work. Okay, so now down here, this is this is really, really important. If you have my file, you shouldn't make the mistake. You gotta commit the record because you just put the um, file into the container. If you go to server, the record is locked. And then I do a half a second pause. This may be unnecessary, but in some of the ones I was having with my customers, some of these files are big and I was having issues every so often and this resolved it. So I'm not sure how necessary this is, but it solved my problems. Um, down here, we're gonna we're gonna make another JSON array with parameters. Action is currently not being used. Um, I used it previously for one of my files, and I left it in here because I find it to be useful if you need to add some extra logic to what's happening with the import on the server. We say whether or not we're going to wait, um, and then we also do the. Uh, I don't think this is necessary for this demo. And then we pass the ID import, which is very very important. Okay, so we're gonna cancel this. And now we do that same, hey, is PSOS functional? Again, I said I repeat these same things. Uh, if so, we're gonna perform it on server, else we're gonna do it locally. But I have an extra step in here that says, hey, are we waiting? Um, 
uh, if so, let's have completion on else off. And then down here, if we're waiting or it's local, we can actually handle some error capturing, which I'm gonna come back to. And that should basically be the end of the script. So let's go to the magic here. So now we're on the server, we pass our parameter. Again, we're using that same custom function I showed you to get our action, which currently is not being used to get ID import, which is really, really important for this whole thing or what work to get. And then we actually get the file name a, a slightly different way. So we go to the director layout. So now we're on the host, okay? We're on the, the server and we're back on this layout. And if you can imagine this, I could drag one in there. The file is sitting in there, okay? We put it in locally, but now we're up on the server. I'm gonna move that out of the way. And we say, hey, what's the name of that? You can actually ask the container, we get the name of it, okay? Uh, then we get just a, a temporary path, um, a file ID, and we check for some stuff. And if it's bad, we abort. I'm gonna talk about this stuff here in a moment. And then this is the part that I stole from John Eisen, um, or he shared with me. And so this, and as Ed or someone had said it earlier, I think you use the create path or the create file. And that's exactly it. So we create a data file, we open the data file, and we essentially create the CSV um, from the container, which is so useful. Um, I am by no means, like I said, I took this from John, another RCC engineer is using it. I imagine there are others that are familiar with this, but if you're not familiar with it, it's awesome. Because for years and years, trying to solve this specific issue was very difficult. Okay, and then we have some logic that says, well, if the file is states, we're gonna import. And we just have a basic import setup where we have the path in here. You can ignore this, this was just so I could set it up, but there's our path. And then we check for an error. Now, again, keep in mind, if we're not waiting for completion, these errors are gonna be sent to empty ears. You could actually go back to the uh, the import record and put the error in there or, or log some uh, some of the information that comes back. I thought about doing that and I'm just not in this demo file, but keep in mind, you have ID import up here. So you could go back to that import record and add some of the results of what happened here. But more importantly, when we go to do this import, let's go to states for a second, they're all set up the same way. There's ID import and on import, this will, this will auto calculate because we've got it set to do that in the import. So we don't have to do some replace command at the end. It's just gonna automatically inherit those IDs that we need to, okay? So then it finishes, it goes to the very bottom here. It says, hey, let's go to the director. Let's delete the container. Let's clean up after ourselves. We're done with the table. Let's clear it off. Um, and then we're gonna do this PSOS set error. So this is also just some basic JSON. If you know JSON, you don't need the custom function, but it encodes it into two different forms. And this is something that I also took from another RCC engineer. I just made it into a custom function. And similar to how FileMaker codes come back to us or errors come back to us with a code and a message, that's what we have here. So if I click on this and I do PSOS set error, my two parameters are code and message. Okay, and so I can pass zero for no errors. I can pass a message back. Um, and then I do something that Art, who works at RCC does, which is what if I know there's a problem, but it's not a real FileMaker error code. So um, I talked to Art about this because we both handled it two different ways. And I actually really liked what he did. So I just copied him. So up here, I know that if I'm missing a parameter, like the file name, which is really important, I pass an error code of negative one. And what's nice about this, and it doesn't need to be one, but basically negative numbers are indicative of error codes that we're inventing for some other reason, where the positive integers are gonna be real error codes that FileMaker is passing. So then back here on file loop, if we're receiving the error, we grab the code um, from the result. If the code doesn't equal zero, then we do a custom dialogue and we display the error and the message to the user, which is really handy. Okay, so then we go back to our import here and we do the, the next one. So this is kind of like a rinse and repeat and then we clear out our global so that we're not just storing anything in there. Um, I wanna pause for a second before I show you guys some of this in action and how to use it. And are there any questions? I know that uh, uh, John's adding some extra stuff. 
um, or variable for those reference uh, that is saved to much uh, bad banging CSV files and putting them into FTP folder. Beautiful. Um, so Marks, I don't think I see any other questions. Um, there's kind of like an off topic question, but I wanted to get to that after you were finished doing demo stuff. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually just going to run another import here and I'm going to turn on, this is not in the demo, but it doesn't matter for you guys, but I have another um, source file in here. It's a little bit bigger. It's got more than like one or two fields and it's got over a thousand records. I don't want to show you that this, this is in fact fairly quick here. So the first thing I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the import because I have this found count of four. If you guys remember, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to nuke everything out that we have and then bring it in. So if I go ahead and click import, I say, okay. And right now we're seeing that half second delay. Now, some of you might be like, wow, that's kind of slow. You see that on there, but keep in mind, I've done this with like, again, somewhere between one and 2 million records. And that imports quite fast. Um, depending on the complexity of tables, it can still take hours. Like I, I, that's why I like the PSOS being off or using a secondary machine. Um, so this one's not going to show anything in here. This is the, the master, which if I delete it, will kill all of these. But I can go to customers and I can see, okay, it looks like those records did in fact import. I can go to sales and I can see that invoice is there. I can go to employee, which has a lot more table uh, records, and I can see that that's there. And if I decide, ooh, you know what? Sales went bad. I can delete that one. I click, there we go. I could go back to the script. Because again, this is more for developers than your layman. So I'm going to say, well, I don't need these. And I do need this. And actually, you know what? I'll do the uh, employee just a second time, just for fun. We're going to come over here. Um, I don't want to nuke everything. So I'm just going to go over here and I'm going to say import. Go back to show all. So there's my first master import, customer, employee, master import, sales, and employ uh, employee. And we'll go to the employee table that's a little bit larger. And again, I demoed this earlier, but let's say we realize that the second import was bad while the first one was good. I can come over here and say, you know what? Get rid of that. And it just deleted half of those records. So the, the cascade delete is actually really, really fast and powerful. So it's nice that you can say, I just want those. You can see not on this one, but if we come back over here, all of these have that, this is import ID over here. I should have put the labels, but all of these, the last field is the um, the import ID. So they all inherit that one. Uh, similarly, let's say I wanna keep this master in sales, but this one I realize I need to redo. I can come up here to the uh, master. I can delete that and boom, it, it has to gather up all those records. Now I just have the master in sales. Similarly, I can just truncate everything, which I don't think oh, it does truncate the import. Let me look at my notes real quick. I think I've got most of my stuff there. Oh, if you do go to use this and experiment with it, I want to show you guys a spot, uh, poten the potential problem. Um, and that's uh, line 67 here to 70. There's this loop where it's trying to put the file in the container. And um, in my use, every once in a while, uh, it was still importing while well, the next one's trying to come in there. And so if we get an error, it says, hey, just keep trying again. Um, when everything's written correctly, this is fine. If things are not written correctly, this will just infinitely loop on you. So you might have to open your debugger and kill it. So I just wanted to point that part out. And I think I mentioned to you guys when the cascade is bad. Um, and then the setting, the uh, 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 passing back the the uh, the JSON. So one thing I glossed over, but it's it's pretty well. I say it's pretty simple, but you've never done it. It might not necessarily be. But in the same way, we have this custom function up here to get the parameter from the JSON file names or purpose down here for that PSAW stuff. We have a very similar thing. So we have PSAW get error. So the cool thing with the PSAW set and get error is if you're not real JSON savvy. It doesn't matter. You can just take the custom function and just fill out the error code and whatever message you want right here with those two parameters. And on the client side, you can receive them using PSOS get error. And PSOS get error has also two custom or two parameters. So if we do PSOS get error, it'll ask you for the JSON, which is the result. Well, it's the script result. And then you can either say, I want the code or I want the message and just leave that text and it'll work. Okay, so that was that part. So that's one of the things I think is kind of nice in here in terms of the tips and tricks 
is I've got a handful of custom functions that I use pretty regularly. Um, even just take a, a look here at this whole, how I, how we call PSOS. These two scripts of, of start PSOS or start and PSOS, I use almost, almost daily, um, if not multiple times a day. So, and then with the, uh, the result at the bottom here, this result is one of the more basic ones. I actually like this one with the, the JSON codes a little bit better. The other thing is if you're more savvy, um, that PSOS set error is a JSON object. So you can, just like everything else with JSON, encode series of other pieces of data if you need. Um, do, uh, do you have an implemented way to handle related records? So you don't import and get foreign constraint errors over and over again. I'm not sure if I fully get that. Do you have a way to implement to handle related records? So you don't import and get foreign constraint errors over and over. Andy, could you maybe give me a little bit more clarification? Um, Cause when I'm like, what the import I'm doing this for, um, there's all kinds of relationships. Now for that client, I'm going to rebuild the relationships later. He's already got keys that work. So I'm actually not setting uh, primary keys or foreign keys. They're just being imported directly. So I'm probably misunderstanding your question a little bit. Um, and I'm definitely not getting any errors. How do you stop the loop in the data viewer in the script called import file loop? Okay. So let's say that thing goes crazy. Um, we'll come over here. I think I can record lock myself and create this issue. There we go. I think I'm gonna cause this to myself right now. We'll see. And I'm gonna click that. Let's see if it goes nuts. Uh, I didn't. What you would what you would do, Lynn, is just come up here to tools. You're gonna have the uh, the uh, what do you call it? The little hourglass. It's gonna it, it's sometimes and you just hit script debugger and then just hit the stop on there. The other thing you could do, um, I noticed this after I shared the demo file with Margaret, is we could make that condition a little bit smarter. So let's say down here where it says, hey, if get last error, we could add like a counter in here um, and say, hey, if it's tried 10 times and it's failed, exit. Um, you could do something like exit loop if get active modifier key equals 16. And then if you know it's screwing up, you can hold the command key and that will abort it. So there's a couple different ways. The easiest is just is just get the script debugger open when it's happening. Um, that'll that and I mentioned that because I wrote all this a while ago and forgot about it. But this morning when I was testing it, I, I had a, a flaw in my logic and it was looping myself. Um, okay, here's an example. So you have two tables, contacts and addresses. Now you create 20 contacts which relate to non-created addresses, um, but you give them both files to the import. So I've, uh, I've got two tables, contracts and addresses. I create the 20 contacts, which relate to the created addresses, um, but you give both files to the import. So I guess you're saying if I delete, if I have a cascade delete turned on for the contacts to addresses, if I delete one set of contacts, I delete the addresses. Um, something, uh, ID address, address, something like that as the database structure. Now you insert the contacts import and the addresses import, but it tried to import the contacts and relate to IDs addresses that don't exist. Um, you can import the contacts and have them relate to addresses that don't exist. Um, you could import them in either order as long as they're not looking up from each other. So. As an example, with the client that I'm that I'm doing, we import all of the customers, um, and then we import all of the orders, and the orders are related to the customers. So, in the example that you have of like contacts and addresses, we do contacts first, and then address uh, addresses second. We don't have an issue. So, I'm probably um, I'm probably still missing something you're saying. I apologize for that, but if you can help me point me in the right direction, I want to I want to get your question answered. The order that you import absolutely matters. So I don't, if I, I mentioned this at the beginning, but I want to go back over it is uh, like the PSOS wait for completion off. Super cool. You're importing two tables at the exact same time. But if table one is a lookup for table two, so let's use your example. Maybe I get this a little bit more. Let's say that the contacts have a lookup to get using ID address to get the address out of it. So it's a local field. Um, the addresses absolutely have to import before the uh, the contacts do. So on this script, the import ma uh, import start, I call it master and my other file. 
this order right here is is set up for a very specific reason. Um, these things need to happen before these things down here. And then under the file loop, I have this wait thing that says, hey, if the file equals this, or it equals this, or it equals this, you need to wait. So in my client's file, this is actually a, a bigger string because there are about five or six tables that they have to complete before the next one goes. Otherwise, things do not properly get related to each other. Um, and then uh, you're importing multiple CS files to different tables. Yes. Can you import a single CSV to multiple tables? In other words, columns A, C in one table, columns C, D in another table, and so on. Uh, yes, you can. So I'm trying to think of the best. For my client, we do something actually quite complicated. We go into a temporary table. And then from that temporary table, we export data into different tables, including notes and tables that we've already imported into. So he has something called memos, and we have a, a million of them. So memos go in, and then I know how to find the ones that I'm looking for. We export them and say, put you here, put you here, put you here. But Ed, what you could do is let's go to the import spot. And so over here, it says, hey, if file name equals this import here. But what you might say is, no, 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 no. I'm gonna, I have file name going into two or three different spots. So instead you could use this action. So you, maybe your thing says, hey, maybe you get rid of file name altogether and just pass action. I'll show you that in a second. Or you say file name equals states, whatever your first sequence is versus your second sequence. So over here, whoops, let me cancel that. This This file grabs the action grabs the action ID or action variable, but I'm not passing anything to it, but I left the structure in there because I use it myself. So over here, when you call PSOS, you'll notice in the parameter right here, there's a spot for action and it just says action variable, but I don't think it's actually being set up here. So you just, there it is, use for manual run. So you need to bake in whatever your logic is that instead of importing based on the file name, you could say import based on this reason, this reason, this reason. And yeah, over here, you could absolutely take states and like, or we'll take employees because this one has lots of fields and say, hey, I want, you know, these ones to be imported. We would say, you know, turn those ones off. Um, I'm gonna turn it back on just in case we do this import again though. And then down here, you could say, you know what? I don't want these ones but, or vice versa, whatever your logic needs to be there. I, th I think that answers your question. Ken, let me know if I didn't quite answer it or that was confusing. And I see John jumped in too. Um, yep, you do the order in the script, not the order in your upload of the files. So that makes more sense. Yeah, so that that's it's really important there, Andy, that this order, there's some logic there in addition to that saying, hey, when to wait, when to wait. Because when I first built this, I set it up where nothing waited and it was demonstrably fast. The problem is the table that had 750,000 records, um, it, would, it, would, it wouldn't it would finish in time and the next thing would start that's actually importing into it. And so it would only import into the, into the records that existed. Yeah, so th this script, I tried to make this a little bit easier for everyone, but there's also some little things in here to make it more configurable. And that's why I say this most definitely is not for uh, users, but, one of the things that's not in here that I also want to kind of just remind you guys, I'm, I'm very specifically saying, hey, this is how we go and do an import. Um, but this client and a couple other clients, I have a duplicate record um, step. And for them, it's not just delete, it's not duplicating a parent. I got to duplicate a parent and the parent has children and the children have children and the parent might have two children. It's a fairly complicated structure. And so I make the import record. This, the purpose is duplication. I say maybe like what I'm duplicating and then all those records that get duplicated have the ID import get set. If it anywhere along the process, I detect an error, I can go and delete the import. Now the transactions that, that Claris is giving us could really help with this issue as well. But the other thing that I like about this is I'm always kind of thinking about what happens when something goes wrong. So if my customer uses that duplicate script, 
and there's an issue and they come to me, I can actually go to a screen like this and get some general idea of like what happened and what they did. And if I realize things are bad, um, I can delete it. Um, before I did stuff like this, I'd always have to go find like the timestamp, who created it, and kind of manually figure out how I'm going to rip those records out of the table and not accidentally delete good data, if, if that makes sense. Sorry, I'm just reading John's thing. That being said, if we import using related files as opposed to the import record script like we're doing, we could do some tricky things. Yeah, if you don't, if you already have other records, then you're really fine on the server because you can do the export command. Um, you, what you can't do, and I'll show you this here, you can't do otherwise, all of this would be so much easier, is up here, I want to export from a container. So I do export field contents and watch, I'm going to say PSOS, just in case you guys didn't get this in the beginning and see how it's grayed out. It's not supported on server. So there's been some workarounds, but most of the time I would just say, you know what, we're just going to pay the piper and wait to import this locally. Um, but if you've got to do the import over and over and over again, um, or they're just demonstrably big, that can be, you know, you can't wait three, you can't tell a client you're going to wait three days and then realize on day two, you had a mistake in one table and then it's going to be six days later till they get their data. Oh, and by the way, you're not working for six days. Um, if, uh, I'll lay out the entire process and the next time we can maybe walk through it in a couple weeks. Yeah, Ken, Absolutely. How do you stop the import on the server if it is taking too much time? You don't. <laughs> well, more uh, put, I'll actually give you a, I, at the beginning of this, I should have given a disclaimer. This is a good way to blow a server up too. The import you might be able to. Um, I gave the caveat about the truncate versus the cascade delete because of a very real world thing that happened. So I was only using the cascade delete and it was working beautifully. And then um, we decided we needed to nuke everything. And at this point we had gone from several hundred thousand records to somewhere again between one and 2 million. And so I triggered the cascade delete and it locked FileMaker up. I forget, I did this twice. The first time I think was 12 hours and um, it was an older version of server. Jacob actually talked about this at a stream recently because of, because of what happened. It didn't just lock up my file, it locked the entire server. This was a flaw in one of the previous versions of 19, I forget, it's, I wanna say 19.5 or three. And so, yeah. Um, and so Jacob had to go make a new server and move everyone over because Christian ruined everybody's day. Well, what could have ruined everybody's day that time? The second time it was an accident. I thought I was in the wrong. I, I came over here and I said, Ooh, I just want to get rid of these. And I did the omit omit, but I forgot to switch to omit. So instead of deleting the thing that takes two minutes, I deleted the thing that took 24 hours. Um, at that point, I really needed to get work done. So I asked Jacob if he could go on the server and kick my user. And he tried and you, it basically had to finish what it was doing. Now, that was a cascade delete. I don't know if he would have been able to kick my user in the middle of an import. My best guess, and I'm not our server guy, um, John might even, it, it, my best guess is it would force it to finish the import and then kick the user. But I'm not, I'm not positive on that. Because the problem with trying to kill it in the middle of an import, Lynn, would be, well, let's let's also define this a little bit more clearly. If you're on the server and it's in this step right here, I'm really not sure what flexibility you would have to terminate in the middle of it. I will teach you guys a trick that I've used um, because, unfortunately, in some of my younger days and even sometimes recent days, I've sent instructions to server and realized that I've got like an infinite loop going on. So what I'll do is I'll open up the file from another computer, or if I don't have my computer locked up, I'll find that file and I'll know that like, let's say there's a loop right here. Let's just pretend it's looping on this. I'll come in and just add a halt script step and save. And uh, depending on the situation, it will actually commit that. And then the, uh, the piece also will come in and see that and terminate. Um, but the main answer is talk to whoever your IT person is or log into the server and try to kick that user. But that's an area I don't want to necessarily give people bad information about. Um, how often does that really happen? I mean, 
uh, a import for three days would probably be be around. It, you know, surprisingly, it's not a hundred gigabytes of data. Um, so I can tell you exactly how big it is, though. Now, let me hide that for just a second. I want to display my client's company name. It's a it's a lot less than you'd think. So here's the actual uh, file. So most of these are in the kilobytes because they're CSVs. The one that takes the most amount of time, if you guys can see my screen here, order is this one right here. This one takes even even um, doing the, the 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 step that I'm showing you guys, uh, it, two to three hours to import that table right there. While this table it's the same size as it takes a fraction of the time. So it depends on the complexity of the table. Sorry, I move my stuff around there. Um, but yeah, Andy, I, how I, that exactly when I didn't build this for this client initially, I said, we're just going to pay the piper and do the import. Um, but then it turned out that this is going to be a multi month type of thing. Um, and similarly, I've got other times where I've just have different times of clients are import. I'm like, you know, it's kind of just nice to manage this, but I think that's a very realistic, reasonable thing to say that like most of the time you don't necessarily need something to sit and orchestrate this. But if you do, um, this is kind of a cool way to manage it. Yeah. And like John says, you know, what are the, what are the comp, what are the relationships? What are the validations? The biggest thing is so like, I've got two tables, one 750,000 records, the other one's a million, the million table record imports almost instantly because it's three or four uh, fields with no auto calcs, no, nothing else. The 750,000 um, uh, record record table has a lot of auto calculation calculations, a lot's going on in that table. So each record that it has to import, all this other stuff has to happen. It's, it's one of the most complicated tables. In fact, I went in and turned off a lot of the auto calcs that I just deemed unnecessary, and that has a huge impact. Um, still three days is a lot. I mean, importing 18 million records takes about 15 minutes. Obviously, that can't be generic, but um, yeah, it, it it did take it did take three days, um, and that wasn't even the full data set that we currently do. Now, again, when I say three days, what I'm saying is that I took a hosted solution, and I didn't do it like this exactly, but essentially said, "Hey, go import this." Found it and had them import from the client to the server. That's what took three days. Taking it and making it happen on the server took a three-day process down to about two hours. We're at about somewhere around four to five hours right now to do the one to two million record import. But yeah, it's hard to measure these things equally because like I said, the million table one I have, it's instant. It's just instant. And I can cascade delete it instantly. But the 750,000 record table, it's like, it's a whole different monster because of the complexity of that table. But very good point. All right, I still see some people typing, so I'll hang out for a minute. Kind of a very intense conversation. Oh, no, no problem. Um, where is the name of the list on the left coming from? I .e. where? Oh, I was in his ploy spell wrong or something like that. God, thank you. Didn't I say earlier that I like to spell words wrong? So um, two things. This is just a master detail. We're in imports right now, and that's our master detail. Um, what you're seeing spelled wrong, Ken, thank you. I spelled it wrong initially, and I thought I fixed it, is over here in the first script. I passed these parameters. So you see employee right here. That's where it's spelled wrong. Fortunately, that doesn't functionally do anything it's just some good feedback for christian but uh i'm i'm more than happy to acknowledge that spelling is my uh, one of my weakness uh can you can you create a data set with 10 columns where two to three have relationships in it and won't it take much long i think for me the relationships have been less of an issue as far as i know as the um the cal the auto calculations that's uh calculations auto calculations um, I'm really nitpicky about every table having like date created, account created, user created. But for that one table, I decided, you know what, all of them are going to have the exact same thing. I turned all of those off. That made it way faster. The problem is that table functionally needs a lot of calculations to, to work. And I can't turn those off. That's, and that's, what's taking a long time, but you're right, Andy, you can, you can import, you know, a million records pretty really darn fast even to a server if it's if there's light structure 
Um, if the text fields are just foreign keys, it wouldn't have much overhead, but the auto enters, lookups, calculations, field validations are where, yeah, it, exactly. Um, so I'm gonna read Andy's out loud in case I, I realize I'm reading some of these in my head and if YouTube's listening. So Andy says, okay, well, I can't say anything on that as we use a separate SQL database and just import from that. Probably could also be a neat part to connect FileMaker using ODBC and then import using SQL. Um, depending on the situation. So I think where Andy's getting into this one, I'll say is just every situation is going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm trying to make this more generic. So I, I've made this import table, as I called it, for a couple different reasons. One of them is to manage imports primarily so that I could do the cascade delete. That's where all of this started from. Some of the other stuff is extra. Then I use that for PSOS related features where I wanted to see what happened when those things went to server and be able to control delete them. In fact, I don't think I've ever streamed on it, but I have several other files where I have what I call the trash can. And similar to the import table, it's basically a table with, you know, like one or very few records with relationships to other table with the cascade delete. So you can go and you can say, hey, trigger and do these deletes. Um, so that's part of the, the story there. With the client that I've been referencing a lot in this, um, his data source is a DBF file. Even getting that to the CSV files that we could import into FileMaker has been a whole process. OBDC and SQL, even though he uses SQL within it, have not really been options. So it kind of just depends. Um, and then Lynn said, can you occasionally get feedback during import on your client as to how many records have been imported on a server? Yes. So there's a couple ways to do this actually. And it's it's not as hard as you might think. Um, what I'll show you the bad way and then I'll show you another way. So in my tables, a lot of times I'll go and I'll add something called count. So I like all my summary fields to be in caps lock. You guys might've noticed an import if you were paying close attention that my summary field for the list, I've got lists as a caps lock. So that's just a thing that I do. So I'll add something called count and I'll make a summary field that is either a total or a count of like ID constant. And then in the um, portal over here, I can put that somewhere up here and you'll see the number change in real time, but it's really slow. It has to sit update and then the layout becomes like unusable. So I did that because exactly that when I wanted to monitor what was going on and it was really cool to have this screen and like click between them and see it. But in application, it was terrible to use. Um, I'll show you what I do for my other client. We'll see if we can watch this in real time or not, because his is so big, you, you can do this pretty easily. So I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to omit all of these and I'm going to do an import and I'm going to hit OK and I'm going to click on this. Oh, you know what? I do it on a second machine, so we might not see it on this one. OK, so I'm going to let me back up for a second. I have a Mac mini that sits below my laptop. I do all my imports on the Mac mini. And then Lynn, I just log in on the other computer. I open the table view and you watch this number just climb. Um, for that customer, like we're talking about hundreds of thousands, millions of records. So you can come in here and watch it count the 750,000. That for me has been as much as it sucks because I got to open the table views has been more useful because you're in the middle of that import step. So you can't go like update the, the import or you put the summary field with the count on here, but just be advised that that even though it gives you the feedback you're looking for, it can kind of suck. All right. Uh, any final questions? I know we're about 17 more. Perfect. 17 over. So you guys have that file by all means. If you have questions about it, you know, tweak it. I would look at it. You know, Andy, you don't have to use it exactly for what's in there, um, but there might be some little things you can pull out of it. At bare minimum, if you've never done it before, John Eisen's little code that I stole for writing the data files, that's probably one of my favorite things in there. Yeah. All right, Marcus, I'm going to pass the driver's seat back to you. Yes, I think we're good. Okay, thank you very much, Christian. Seriously, this was awesome. Um, I am going to grab back to that person's comics. It might make an interesting sample file for later in the future. Y'all have a good weekend, everybody. And uh, I think next week is the start of... Yeah, it is. Okay, next week, come back for JavaScript. Seriously, this is really cool. People ask us about this all the time. Uh, see you next Tuesday, everybody. Enjoy the three-day weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Uh, got a report of an individual up here who uh, may be a FileMaker license. Uh, well, it's potentially expired. Look at the back of that car right there. Looks like the FileMaker license has expired. Sir, I need you to step out of the vehicle. Sir, sir, step out of the vehicle. Sir, 